Heavenly Father, thank you for each person here. Um, thank you for, for blessing us so far in, in the stories and songs and the sharing that we've been able to do. Um, your word is before us, and um, I pray that uh, as we go through some things together that uh, we'll all be built up in your name. Amen. Imagine that you are a child over 100 years ago on the West Coast, an Adventist child, and, and um, your folks are on their way with you to visit a very important person. Probably in a horse and buggy. The automobile had been invented, but the Model T was not out yet. And so you, you make the drive over, and you climb out, and you go up into the house. And it's a little chilly, so you head over to the fireplace. You're just trying to get warm at first, but then you see the tiles around the fireplace. And they're rather mysterious and delightful pictures, probably imported, probably from Europe. And you're trying to figure out what the pictures are of, because they're not familiar pictures. And you hear a woman's voice behind you saying, do you like the pictures on my fireplace? They came with the house. Do you know the story? And you're looking at them and you're trying to think of all the Bible stories that you ever knew and they're just not coming up. They look like older stories. They're clearly not, you know, 1900 type stories, but, but you can't place them. And she says, these are the stories about King Arthur and his knights and Camelot. If you start over here, this is where the story begins, and she points to a picture of a young boy pulling a sword out of a stone and goes through every tile telling the story. Of course, she says as she wraps it up, these are just stories people invented. Most of the time, we have family worship in this room where we read from the scriptures. That's the best, best picture I could find of it. Does it surprise you? that Ellen White knew the story of King Arthur and would tell it to the children of visitors who came to Elmshaven. Is that news to you? It's true. Uh, you can go there and the tour guide will tell you about it, emphasizing, of course, these are not true stories. Uh, the tiles are still there. They came with the house. Uh, the previous owner put them in, and, and while she would not have probably chosen them, she was not, so, not the kind of person to just get rid of them. I was thinking about Arthur this week and decided to start with a story about Ellen White knowing the tale so that I could share this with you. Uh, next slide. What's that? The Round Table. Not the real one. This is a 12th century replica. The paint job is... Uh, from Henry VIII, so the paint is a little bit later than the actual table. Um, there's a lot of aspects to this story, but I, I was really struck by the round table. You know, uh, the, the, the original version of the story was kind of cobbled together by a, a monk named Geoffrey, and he wanted to have, he wanted to depict a heroic past for, for Britain, but most of the legendary material that existed in his time were things from Greece and Rome, and and those were pagan. So when he pulled together the story of Arthur and his knights, the first version, it was a Christian story. Now, being the medieval period, um, there were some issues with it. We talked about that in Sabbath school this morning. But his intentions, I think, were good. And I was thinking about the round table and how it reflects the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus. The knights sat in a circle so that none of them was able to think of himself as better or above any of his fellows. Does that sound like the New Testament to you? Galatians 3 verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. Okay. Okay. And Jesus talked about a table once. He says, you know, if you're invited to a dinner, don't sit near the head because you might be embarrassed. They might ask you to go down to the other end of the table. The table in that story wasn't around. Uh, there's an echo of the Galatians verse in Colossians. This one's less famous, but um, it's, it says uh, something quite similar. It says, there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, 
Scythian. Any barbarians or Scythians here? Okay, cut a, cut a couple of hands. Very good. Wow. Okay, slave or free, Christ is all and is in all. You guys know who the Scythians were? I had to review on this. I knew they were from up north relative to Paul. Um, but uh, they were kind of um, warriors that lived on horseback. And quite wild for that time. And if you notice, you, you look closely at the text, you have Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, slave or free. In the other verse, you have male and female paired. But it looks like the barbarians and the Scythians are, pair, are um, paired up. And it's, it's been speculated, that this makes sense to me, that uh, since the word barbarian can refer to people from the south, that he's pairing these two. So you've got wild people from Africa and wild people from central northern Asia, Eurasia. Um, so it, it comes out to no male or female, nor slave or free, no black or white barbarians. In any case, all are one. All are equal. In Revelation today, you guys read, By your blood you have purchased for God those from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You guys read that? It's good stuff. You've made them into a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Okay, some of you are quite familiar with uh, Christian theology, you know, Protestant theology. Some uh, not so much. That's okay. We'll uh, go th uh, into that a little bit together today. In Protestant theology, we have something called the priesthood of all what? All believers, all people. That is, nobody has to go to another person in order to come to God. I'm really glad that I don't have to hear about your sins every week. Okay? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't have to tell anybody mine either, except Jesus. He already knows, and I know that He loves me. Okay? And I'm not trying to diss other denominations uh, I just find that the, the concept that the apostles taught was a round table concept. Everybody's equal. We have one high priest, that's Jesus, and he's above us. He, he speaks to the Father on our behalf, always lives to make intercession for us. But as for the rest of us, we're this kingdom of priests, Revelation says, priests of the round table. None of us is above the other. All of us can go to God on our own. Enter boldly before the throne of grace, the Bible says. And today, we got uh, an ordination service, okay? And uh, we're going to lay hands on, on John and on Ryan. And um, there's a lot we could say about that, but I want to be respectful of, of not overwhelming all of you guys with the different things that we can find in the Bible about this. But we are going to go over some of it, and we're going to go over some of the practices in our church, too, in our time. If anyone aspires, this is from Titus 3. Paul's writing to a pastor named Titus and uh, trying to encourage him as far as local church leadership goes. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil." Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace, into, well, another snare of the devil. A lot of stuff here, right? A lot of requirements. Um, I could go through it word by word, but I want to hit some high points in light of what we're doing today. <clears throat> Above reproach. Um, does that mean that these overseers, these leaders, never make mistakes? Okay. What it does mean is that um, they're aware when they make a mistake and they're willing to make it right. Okay? Above reproach. They don't have to be called on it necessarily by someone else. Or if they do, if they are called on it by someone else, they're willing to see that perspective. 
Okay. Um, what about the husband of one wife? That's kind of what we do in this country, right? Two people get married, all right? Husband and wife. Um, in other parts of the world, this is more of an issue. In um, Africa, it was quite a, quite a, a challenge for a bit because um, the leaders, church leadership, missionaries, all you know believed in in uh, monogamous uh, man woman marriage there, and the local culture had men with multiple wives. And so, how do we do this? We want to baptize them. Are we going to send um, the second or third wives away? And that turned out to be not a very Christian thing to do because that was their kind of their um, social support. They didn't have anywhere else to go for someone else to provide for them, for some to provide for them. So uh, it just meant that these people could be baptized and be a part of the church, but they weren't going to be elders. They had their hands full at home. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, da -da -da. The, the literal language here is one woman man. That's kind of, it sounds nicer. It sounds a little bit more folksy. Uh, your leaders have to be uh, one woman men. Okay? The idea is not just the number of wives, but proclivities. It doesn't necessarily exclude divorced men. Uh, that would depend on the circumstances in each case. A not quarrelsome. Someone who goes looking for trouble or faults in other people is not qualified. And more's the pity, I am not sure any of us would be surprised at discovering church people who enjoy looking for the faults of others. I won't ask you if you enjoy the faults of, uh, looking for the faults of others, because I think it is a temptation more of us would uh, have than would really want to admit. Um, have you ever heard about a church fight? You can raise your hand for this if you ever heard about it. Ever heard about a church fight? I didn't say if you were a participant. I didn't say if it was this church. Have you ever heard of a church fight? Okay. Sometimes those things can bring out the worst in people because we are never more in danger of sin when we are right than when we are right. Okay? Because if I'm right, that must mean that you're wrong and, and therefore I'm better than you. Okay? Not talking about myself today. I'm just saying figure of speech. Okay. All right, what about this? He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. If someone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will, we care for, how will he care for God's church? Now, as, as a pastor, this one's kind of scary to me. <laughs> my, my kids are mostly well-behaved, but there are moments that they're not. <laughs> and uh, what does that mean? Well, and what do you do with, with uh, leaders' kids who are not in the church? Uh, well, do people have free will? Yes, they do. Do kids, your kids or my kids, have the ability to make their own decisions, especially as they get older? Um, if your kids are not in the church right now, I would encourage you not to throw away your patience, as the book of Hebrews says, because it will be richly rewarded. Uh, keep praying. Um, God promises to save our children and I've seen in my own extended family how not giving up uh, when it comes to praying for people who are not spiritually involved is really important, and eventually God will come through. I believe that. Okay. Sometimes kids uh, stick with the spiritual life as adults. At least sometimes they don't. Um, but when it comes to finding, you know, to, to, to select a leader in the church, sometimes you just have to look into it a little bit. It's not that we want to get into gossip. At least we shouldn't want to get into gossip. That's something I've had to work on. Um, but sometimes it helps to know. Um, there was a couple I used to know that had two sons, one of whom died and the other became uh, a violent criminal. And I never found out the complete backstory, but it was made clear to me by the church family at that case that it was not the parents' fault. Whether something snapped in his mind or, or he, was, he had some kind of trauma, it wasn't something that was going on in the home at all. He just went down the wrong path. On the other hand, uh, I had a great regret from some years back before, uh, when I was about to move, this was... Like I said, it was a while ago. Um, I found out right before the move that one of my long-term elders, uh, you know, he was good up front and, and um, 
valuable in that, that he would bring up contrary opinions to things and, and kind of keep us on track in that way. I found out that in his business and in his home, he, he had a tendency to treat people horribly. And uh, one of his daughters was estranged from the family, and we found out she was protecting herself and her own family. I didn't know, and the church didn't know, that this man was unqualified for the office of elder by virtue of how he treated these people that were close to him. So, again, we're not looking at gossip. We're looking at how a person relates to those near him. Even Jesus lost Judas. Okay, so people do make their own decisions, but uh, it, it helps to know. So that's, what, that's something we've got to consider when it says um, keeping his children submissive and, and, and so on. Uh, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. This happened to a colleague of mine. He had a new member who was very enthusiastic and wanted to help uh, spread the news of Jesus' soon return and, and, and got involved up to his neck in a lot of different things in the church. And, and um, he was never an elder, but they rushed him into other positions and, and um, things went south. Uh, it turns out that the guy was not at fault, but there were some accusations made and... Um, he just didn't have the, the spiritual maturity for the office that he was in, let's say. Um, there was, it came up in a court, state court, that uh, the member had lost his prestigious position uh, in the church over some things that happened. And again, it turned out to not be his fault, but it was, it was a mess. And the fact that he thought that being a church leader was a prestigious thing was disturbing to me. There are no prestigious positions in church. It's, it's a round table because everybody's equal. There's just, just different ways that we serve. Uh, the leader must be well thought of by outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Okay? And I won't get into this, but I've seen this happen too. Leadership. You know, I want everybody to feel like they can come to church, but, you know, um, as far as who is in charge, we have to be careful about, about some of those things. Okay, so what about that line Paul says here at the beginning, it's a good thing to desire to be an overseer. I have trouble with that line because a lot of times I find that if somebody wants to be an elder or a, a pastor or leader in the church, there might be something funny going on that, that might disqualify them. I think I told you guys a story about a, a conference president many years ago in another part of the country. Um, they believed God had called him to be a conference president, and when he lost his job at the election, he was really distraught and disturbed and couldn't figure out what was going on. And I hope somebody took him aside and said, look, we're here to serve, whether that's in a local church or even, you know, in any, any capacity, we have to go where God sends us. And that there's nobody who's above another person. Okay? And... Uh, while he does say it's a good thing to desire to be an overseer, it is a task, it is a mission, it is a job for God's people and for the work of the church. It says in Hebrews that no one takes this honor on himself. He receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Now he's talking about the Old Testament priesthood, but I think the principle applies. Um, the main verse for today indicates where we stand. This was read earlier. Andy shared it with us. Um, you are not to be called rabbi. We don't call Andy rabbi. We're not going to call Ryan or John rabbi. Um, you have one rabbi, one teacher, the Christ. You're all brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone earth, on earth your father. One is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers as a title. For, sorry, one, for one is your teacher, the Christ. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Uh, I don't mind being called Pastor Tom by the kids because they have to call adults by various respectful names or whatever. Just that's something that kids have to do. Mrs. Kennedy or Teacher Melanie for or Jonah's teacher or whatever it is. Um, but respect is something that adults show each other, and there's no... None of us are above another person. So while my job as pastor, it's, it's not my name. 
Okay, that was going to be my original title, but I didn't want it to be about me. Okay, um, this is how I serve, but I'm not on a different spiritual plane than other people. Okay, um, these people, these men are going to be serving, serving as elders. What that means in our time is, first and foremost, their function is to encourage you all, as a church family, to pursue a relationship with Jesus. Highest priority, guys. Okay, if you're going to be ready for Jesus to come, you need to be encouraged. And I believe that uh, they can do that. Um, if you look in the church manual, there's other, other roles as well. Um, I was reminded when I opened it this week that they're to encourage good stewardship of our resources, including financial ones. Okay? Uh, they lead services. This happens when I'm here and when I'm not here. Okay? Um, they are uh, to be worship leaders in that respect. Um, they can baptize when the pastor can't for whatever reason. Um, they're to encourage all the work of discipleship that we do here and to keep good relationships with the conference. Uh, Adventism has a very specific structure. It's a good structure that goes around the world, and uh, we're all on the same team. So it's helpful to remember that and uh, to keep in contact with what's going on here in southern Idaho and eastern Oregon. You guys saw here we've got a town hall coming up, so everybody's invited to that. Um, in my mind, there's a tension between how the Bible depicts the laying on of hands and how we do ordination. It looks to me like we ordain a person for a position or to recognize that a person has been called to a certain position. And the Bible is a little bit different. As long as an Adventist elder maintains membership, doesn't get into discipline, uh, something like that, that person is considered to be ordained for life. And, and the Bible instead depicts people being ordained for mission. Here's an ordination service in the book of Acts. They ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Barnabas and Saul, that's Paul, uh, for the work to which I have called them. And having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. And being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to, and then it goes on to the place names of their mission. Um, the way that I reconcile the contrast between what happens in the book of Acts and how our church does it is this. Those of you who are being ordained as elders, or have been already, you have a noble task, as Titus says. You're to lead God's people in Mount Home in their work of living and sharing the gospel until Jesus comes back. And uh, you'll see there in your bulletin, we're going to do ordination now, and I would like to invite uh, John and uh, Ryan to come up here. And those of you who have already been ordained as elders, whether you're serving in that capacity or not, you're welcome to come down as well. Uh, we're going to have prayer together. And um, this is the topic. So uh, I would like to have these guys come down. I'm going to kneel down and invite them to kneel with me here. And uh, we'll surround them. <clears throat> circle must be unbroken. <laughs> uh, Heavenly Father, um, we set before you John and Ryan, and Byron and Sean and Andy and I, um, we're just passing on uh, to our friends, our church family members here, family members, <laughs> um, what you've given to all of your church, and that is the role of, of spreading the gospel and, and being the kingdom, the visible kingdom on earth as we're looking forward to the coming of Christ and trying our best to speed its coming. We believe your Holy Spirit has already filled these men and we're asking for a double or triple portion of that to strengthen them in this work. They know the responsibilities. I pray that they would not be overwhelmed by them, but to know that because you've called them, you've also enabled them. Go with them from this time forward, and may the, work, the mission be successful uh, in their experience. May they be able to see the results, and um, I pray that for the church as well. The sooner Jesus comes back, the better. So bless John, bless Ryan to that end, and all of your church family as we continue to serve each other in different ways. In Jesus' name, amen.